Hello, everyone. It is so nice to see you here. Uh, I am Tita Chico, Professor of English and Faculty Director of the Center for Literary and Comparative Studies at the University of Maryland. I am very, very delighted to welcome everyone to this public humanities workshop that we are honored to co-sponsor with Sandy Spring Museum. It's a delight to partner with our colleagues at Sandy, uh, Sandy Spring Museum. Our institutions are, as the crow flies, 12 miles apart, close but also far away. We hope that this collaboration is only a beginning of developing the connections and possibilities that um, we share in all of our work. This workshop on the part of the center is a, a part of our year-long project on public humanities research and engagement, which features six public humanities projects developed by faculty and graduate students at the University of Maryland. And this year also comes out of our two years dedicated to specific um, public-facing programming on anti-racism as a research topic, as a practice, as a theme, and as a common endeavor. I wanna offer a few words as we begin. The University of Maryland, our institutional home, was built in the 19th century on the original homelands of the Anacostan and Piscataway tribal nations. The university has recently taken very modest measures to recognize its indigenous history, developing a land acknowledgement and naming a new dining hall, a word in Algonquin, which means a place to go to eat. I was struck by a recent student op-ed, which said, absent substantive actions, these modest measures are performative and they're lacking. The long 18th century, as a dear colleague of mine has said, is not over for the people connected to this land. The University of Maryland was also built, was built too in the mid 19th century through wealth extracted from enslaved black women, men, and children. The first trustees were slavocrats, and 80 years later, Thurgood Marshall was refused admission to law school. But if we look at the census from 1850 and 1860, and I say this with but and and, those documents indicate 12 members of the Adams family in four households adjacent to campus. It's a black family, a free black family. And Adam Francis Plummer was an enslaved black man owned by the founder of the university, Charles Benedict Calvert, a step nephew owned by his step, step uncle. Adam Francis Plummer, he left us his diary. Historical records demand our full critical and creative attention. They demand our stories. Toni Morrison taught us in her 1993 Nobel Prize lecture, that narrative is not merely entertainment, but it's one of the principal ways that we absorb knowledge. What, in other words, were the interior lives of Adam Francis Plummer, the step-nephew of the university's founder? What were the stories of the Adams family living adjacent to campus? These are the sorts of questions that animate our work today, as well as what brings us together in our collective eye to consider the rich and layered archival records at the Sandy Spring Museum. I wanna say quickly and with a lot of gratitude that our programming is sponsored by the Division of Research, the University Libraries, the Graduate School's Office of Diversity and Inclusion and the John and B.B. Petru Foundation. So our, our workshop will open with comments from Lydia Frazier, the Sandy Spring Museum Archivist and Collections Manager. We'll then turn to our panelists who will discuss possible projects and perspectives, and we'll conclude with a general conversation. But before then, I would like to turn this over to Allison Weiss, the Executive Director of the Sandy Spring Museum. Allison? Thank you, Tita. Um, as Tita said, I'm the executive director of Sandy Spring Museum, and um, we had just recently adopted a new mission, which I feel like is very relevant to share with everyone today. Our mission is to connect diverse communities and advance social equity through shared and inspiring experiences of our region's cultural heritage. So the museum doesn't act as a gatekeeper. We are not the end storytellers. We make our resources available for other people to tell the complete story of Sandy Spring. And one of the reasons that this program today was, was brought to us, brought to this collaboration 
was because of a project that we're working on that Lydia will be describing in more detail called Equity and Metadata. But I just wanna say briefly that the museum was founded in 1980 and we have a very extensive archives that we always assumed only contained the history of the white families and specifically of the white Quaker families in the area because their descendants were the ones who donated these materials to us. But upon closer examination of the materials, we realized that there was uh, just as much information about Black history as there was about white history, and we just weren't looking for it. It was there all along, and through our own bias, we were only seeing the white history of the area. And so we undertook this project called Equity and Metadata so that we could rectify our um, bias collecting practices from the past. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Lydia, who is um, our archivist and collections manager, and also the person who conceived of our Me Equity and Metadata project. Okay, thank you, Allison. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay, great. So um, Sandy Spring Museum has a commitment to the um, concept of uh, advancing social equity. Also, as stewards of a historical archive collection, we believe that this also includes equitable access to the information held within our collections, as well as the physical items themselves. Our challenge, however, is that our origins as a traditional history museum established in the late 20th century, as Allison said, that our collections were intentionally assembled to serve the telling and retelling of stories and tropes related to the community's dominant culture, which in Sandy Springs case is a white Quaker narrative. Um, that, despite the fact that at times the population of the people of color in this community exceeded its white, white residents. So the project's journey began five years ago in 2018 when we embarked on an inventory of our historical archival collection to answer long-standing questions about its scope beyond anecdotal assumptions. Um, one such assumption going in was that the majority of the collection was related largely to this white Quaker, um, these white Quaker residents. In fact, that did, did prove true. Few items we found related to the community's historic black, uh, black residents. Um, this was neither anticipated and nor was this discovered. The inventory led to the digitization of our archival collection. So unlike the process of inventorying where you go item by item by item, when you digitize a collection, you end up going page by page by page. And in doing so, names started popping up that we recognized as part of Sandy Springs Historically Black community. Names like Hill, Bond, Bowen, Bud, Sedgwick, and the like. The majority of these discoveries were found in ledgers, specifically um, account ledgers of a local doctor named Dr. Caleb Edward Iddings that dated from around 1870s through 1904, as well as a number of farm ledgers spanning from the early 1800s through the 20th century, and then store ledgers that are equally expansive across the 19th century. So beginning over here, with the uh, store ledgers. As an example, um, let's first look at this ledger and um, where on a random day, I guess it's October 4th in 1851, white enslavers, white non-enslavers and free blacks all shared space um, as they often did here daily at the Brookville store. On this page alone, we have Charles Powell, Samuel Budd and Tom Warfield all of whom were free black citizens of Brookville. Ann Easton and John Sullivan were non-enslaving white residents and Reuben Manakee was an enslaver. Um, also, in, so in this, uh, these ledgers, we see what was purchased by whom and at what cost. This next example is taken from a ledger of a white Quaker farmer, Joshua Pierce. Harry Bond, a local black man who worked for Joshua Pierce for nine, um, was a local black man who worked for Joshua Pierce for nine years. It is a relationship that is entirely captured in this one volume. From the entries, we know that Mr. Bond earned um, $6.50 per month and a little bit extra during harvest. We also know that he was then paid in cash um, sometimes, but most often he was um, paid in uh, equivalently, equivalently valued goods. Who made these equivalencies and how, we do not know. We also see that Mr. Bond worked to pay off goods for others in the Black community. Here you can see um, you know, two bushels of wheat, um, 
to Henson Dorsey. Uh, we know that Henson Dorsey was also part of the black community. And we also know that his labor settled a debt with another white Quaker named um, Samuel Ellicott. Further analysis shows, as you go through all of the entries in the ledger, that um, throughout the era, over the course of the nine years, um, Harry Bond did not receive an increase in pay. And then in his final days of employment, Joshua Pierce charged him a significant amount of interest on a debt. Dr. Itting's Dr. ledgers proved to be full of an incredible variety of information, including where people lived. So here we have um, where someone lived. Uh, this is information that is sorely lacking in local 19th century records of landowning, um, a non-landowning tenants. Also, what ailments injuries and conditions befell folks um, at this time. Here we see over here that the daughters of Alfred and Eleonora had an illness that necessitated daily visits from the doctor. It also sheds light on how um, accounts were settled. Over here, you can see that um, by ironing for Mrs. Iddings for a half day, so labor was used to settle the medical bill. Um, while Dr. Iddings' ledgers contain perhaps the most robust information, it is also the most challenging to provide access to given the sensitive, private, and potentially hurtful nature of the data. We are currently working with the local descendant community to transfer the agency and how and how much of their ancestors' information is made publicly available. While we are working towards this goal currently, we have not yet reached um, a, a a, um, a decision or a, a plan. So we are grateful for them to allow us to present these pages um, to you today in a redacted form that they feel preserves the dignity and privacy of the family highlighted here. That said, we also recognize that the documents were compiled by white individuals and contain inherent tacit biases toward the people about whom they recorded information. Finally, the crux of the Equidata and Metadata Project addresses how we can provide direct access to this information. That is, how do we, as our project consultant Rachel Watkins says, center the stories of people like Harry Bond and Alfred and Eleonora without the white doctors, farmers, storekeepers, et cetera, brokering that access. Um, we will do so by applying the same detailed um, subject metadata that you see over here at the item level. We will apply that to the individual pages on which these people are found. Um, doing so will allow us to bring together like materials, both through a biographical and a topical lens, and it makes some strides in dismantling the white person's um, role as gatekeeper to the black person's story. So prior to this workshop, we shared these three examples with your panelists and asked um, just exactly how would you use this information? And so with that, I'll turn it over to Tita to start the conversation. Hi, thank you so much. And let me go ahead and briefly introduce our panelists. Yolanda Hester is an independent public historian, writer and curator and co-founder of Frameworks and Narratives. Oral history figures significantly in her work and research. She's worked on projects for Arthur, Arthur Ashe Legacy at UCLA, the Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, the Center for Oral History Research, KCET, the Phillips Collection, and the National Urban League. Um, her website, I'll put that in the chat. Anne-Marie Mott Ewing is a PhD candidate at the University of Maryland. Her dissertation, Citizenship and the Counterfactual Imagination, Race, Exclusion and Redress in the Literature of the Long Reconstruction, explores the way Reconstruction writings use the counterfactual to, be de to depict the undecided, malleable nature of citizenship. Caleb Hur Hurley is a senior at the University of Maryland College Park, pursuing an Honors English and Literature BA with a Creative Writing minor, minor. For his honors thesis, he's currently composing a collection of short stories that explore the social, political, and physical deaths of Black people, specifically African American men, and how those experiences cascade from father to son, casting Black people as the quintessentialist absurdist figure. He has a great passion for all narrative forms, including literature, film, music, and video games. He believes in the preservation of these forms as our shared cultural record. He plans to continue expressing his curiosity for the world through future narrative endeavors, as he has a foundational belief in the power of storytelling. 
a belief that storytelling has the greatest potential for social, cultural, and artistic innovation while also building community. Maria Vivar Guzman is library associate with Prince George's County Memorial Library System. Born in Mexico and raised in the United States, as a library employee, she works to provide resources to the community, but especially to um, her, the Latinx and refugees communities in the county. As a native Spanish speaker, she's become passionate about helping our teens and adults through art and language programs, but also through outreach and digital literacy. Yolanda, could you start? Hello, thank you so much for having me. Um, so thank you for uh, sharing these documents and sharing your project. I think it's a very interesting project and very important project. Um, one of the first things that, uh, you know, when I first saw the archival documents, two things came to mind. One is personally what types of research projects I personally would be interested in pursuing. And then secondly, how can we use different hit history methodologies for community engagement and uh, bringing more people to interact with archival materials? So in terms of uh, what research projects, uh, you know, I was inspired by and sound, uh, was very interested in um, in looking at these. Um, the store ledger particularly stood out to me um, uh, because it speaks so much to the coexistence of so many communities within the area at that time. Um, however, one of the, the, the things that I would want to know more is I would wanna place these documents within the broader history. So what I noticed is that a lot of these documents were close to the Civil War. They were from 18, 1840s, 1850s. And so I would, I would do more research in what was the impact of some of that broader history on this local community and how did the um, transition from the Civil War into the post-war life um, impacted these communities and how they were able to make that transition. Um, another thing that I was particularly interested in was that this area had a large community of free black, free black people and free black landowners, yet it was surrounded by a large community of enslaved uh, black people. And I would want to do more research on what the relationship between those communities were. That would be very, very important to me, and how much information from this free Black community, I would dig more into your archive and maybe some other archives, can reveal information about the enslaved Black community where there are less documents that were, you know, recorded. Um, and also what that transition from the Civil War into the post-Civil War period was like for these communities, and how did they support each other or you know what were their what was their relationship like so those are some of the kind of research ideas that stood out to me initially um in terms of community engagement and thinking about well what kind of history methodology could we use to engage the 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 public um you know i love community collaboration community participation um, and uh, oral history figures a great deal in my work. Uh, oral history would tell us a lot about the present, could tell us a lot about the present moment, but it could also talk about, you know, the past couple decades. But oral histories with descendant communities or perhaps oral histories with long-term institutions in the community could reach back further in history. So, for example, what I found very interesting is the relationship between the Sharp Street United Methodist Church and the Sandy Spring Friends. And I thought, gosh, what a what a great opportunity for those communities to interview each other. And Sandy Springs can be the facilitator of that or perhaps provide training and some historical context and utilize some of the archival materials um, to help, you know, plan moderate, organize um, this wonderful project between these communities. And these two communities go back. I mean, you know, the Sharp Street United Methodist, as you know, was founded with the help of Quaker, the Quaker community. So I think that could be a very interesting uh, uh, community engaged project. Um, 
also just an oral history on the descendant community um, could be wonderful. Um, another uh, idea that I thought would be interesting, and I think would lean into this idea of equity is developing a language guide specifically for any type of historical exhibition or sharing um, of these older, you know, 19th century, early 20th century, and even older documents. Um, and a language guide can be, you know, a, a project where communities come together to help create that language guide, I think could be um, a really exciting, a really exciting project. And it could be a model for other, you know, community-based organizations as well. Um, and, uh, you know, partnering with local institutions that have been around for a while. So those are my, those were my uh, first ideas that came to my mind when I, when I uh, saw the archival materials. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Yolanda. Anne-Marie, could you join us? Hi, good afternoon. It's so great to be here with um, you all today, even virtually. So thank you for the invitation and thank you for these materials. Um, I've spent a, a little time in the collection of archives since um, Dr. Chico brought them to my attention and found them really illuminating. So as uh, a graduate student, I'm writing my dissertation on 19th century American literature with a particular interest in citizenship and race. And so I just wanted to point out a couple of ways that I think this archive could enhance and complicate our understanding of 19th century Maryland and also give us insight into our own political moment that might spark some ideas of what sort of projects could emerge, some very similar to what Yolanda has mentioned. Um, so we've already seen, thank you, Lydia, the pictures of the ledger from the store uh, and the farm ledger of Joshua Pierce. And those were the two archives I was most captivated by as well. Um, and when we take a look at them, Harry Bond, of course, jumped out um, as a member of Pierce's household, but also as someone who is um, earning wages and um, shopping at the Brookville store. We see in one part of the ledger that he purchases several items that might kind of indicate that he's setting up a domestic space, like a lamp and plates and a mug, which I thought was interesting. And from the farm ledgers, we can see, as you've already said, Lydia, that he's been paid the same wage and there is a heavy interest on them. So I get there are two, two things that this um, reminded me of in the, or felt like it could help with the type of research I'm doing. So the research I'm doing draws heavily, first I wanted to say on scholarship on black citizenship done by a scholar at the University of Maryland, Dr. Christopher Bonner, and also Derek Spires. And I'm looking at some ways that authors in the 19th century, specifically later, like in reconstruction, imagined citizenship differently from how the courts and the lawmakers were at the time um, and enacted it and practiced it even when it wasn't legally granted to them. The word citizen didn't have an agreed upon definition but before the 14th Amendment, so in 1868. So in this time period, these scholars argue that free Black Americans were able to some extent to use that uncertainty to claim citizenship and frame it on their own terms. And many of them were thinking of it as defined by what someone does, not who they are or what their legal status was. Um, some Black activists in this time period, like Hosea Easton, for example, imagine citizenship as a much more collect in a much more collective way than we do, like as a commons rather than a private possession and something that he saw essential uh, to the functioning of any kind of Republican government. And other act African American activists considered how to emphasize forms of economic citizenship as a way to demand their rights. So another Marylander, Frederick Douglass um, in 1848 is is addressing the National Colored Convention and arguing that this kind of economic, um, depend, creating economic, uh, becoming essential to a community is what one way that we that they could advocate for their rights as essential to their survival. Um, so as Dr. Bonner argues, African-Americans were active participants in the process of constructing citizenship 
determining to whom the status was available and what its content would be sort of I think the Sandy Spring narrative actually the archive highlights the way that members of free black communities were engaging in obviously limited but still very vibrant practices of citizenship well before emancipation. Um, and I think these ledgers can show us two things like just that at least that jump out. I'm sure they can show us a million things, but the two that jumped out at me were one, I think they give us a snapshot of an African American man, Harry Bond, enacting a daily form of citizenship. As I said, he's buying goods, earning wages, paying his debts, perhaps setting up a domestic space. And that alone, that record alone speaks back as a counter narrative to the legal records of the same decades, like the 1857 Dred Scott decision, which refuses to acknowledge African Americans as citizens in the US. Um, they also document a man who's doing primarily menial labor, which was at that time, the majority of the labor that African American workers in the North are doing. And that shows the limitations of the, um, the like the ability to for upward mobility in a society that's kind of stymieing African American efforts at every term turn and conspiring to keep them as a permanent underclass by excluding them from jobs that would provide this kind of upward mobility. And second, I think these ledgers tell us a story of some of the limits of white progressivism and the ways that even white Quaker abolitionists like the store owner are benefiting from a white supremacist system, even if he's speaking against it, which perhaps makes it easier for us to recognize and combat the same type of complicity today. So even in a community that might be held up as a beacon of hope in a state where there are still many enslaved on plantations on the Eastern shore and in Sandy Spring as well, free is far from equal. And to get a fuller picture of this, ideally, I think we'd compare Bond's wages and debts and the interest on his debts and the types of jobs he did to white laborers and others in the area to sort of determine what types of labor were available to him as compared to others, like immigrants, for example. That's just one of the many types of opportunities I see for further, re further research into the archives. I think the ledgers ask help us ask questions about the mythologies we have in the, about the US and the way we often mistakenly tell the story of racial justice in the US as one straight line of linear progress or even portray the North as innocent in a history of enslavement and racism. They challenge us to consider how history could have happened differently if alternate ideas of citizenship, those that were imagined by African-Americans at the time had prevailed. And I think they suggest questions like what happens to our scholarship um, or the way we teach history when we foreground the experience of an African-American laborer in Sandy Spring? What if we consider the way that he's just one of the many men who black activists are advocating for at this time when they enact political organizing and citizenship on their terms, even as whites refuse to acknowledge it? I find this archive really rich, as you can probably tell, um, and I think I could have students use it in an undergraduate classroom to spark research projects and to better contextualize literature that we're reading of the time period. Uh, also, having taught elementary school in the past, I, I see possibilities for it to be incorporated into Maryland school curriculums more broadly. You know, all fourth graders go to St. Mary's, for example. This is a really rich archive that is accessible. Um, I could also envision opportunities for collaboration to engage with these legacies in the current community in Sandy Spring, as Yolanda has already mentioned. Like, I guess I'm wondering what reparation or efforts toward reparation could look like in this kind of relatively small community. Are there ways to both memorialize this past and also use it as an impetus to organize against economic disparities that still exist in Maryland because of this past? Um, Lots of questions, I think. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to what ideas emerge today. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Caleb. Yeah, um, I'm gonna echo uh, a lot of what uh, Yolanda and Anne-Marie have already said, and uh, uh, even you, Dr. Chico, uh, because uh, you, you mentioned something about the Adams family and uh, my wife is uh, paternally uh, Adams uh, from this area. So, you know, I'm wondering if there's a connection. I'm going to have to go look into that. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, you know, so when I was uh, looking at these archives, as Amy said, they're very rich. Uh, 
had lots of thoughts, um, uh, particularly personally, because I am, uh, you know, from this uh, area, Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, I grew up in this area. I'm actually from New York, uh, from Brooklyn. Uh, and, you know, I never really had or I felt personally that I had a uh, connection to Maryland or Montgomery County. I've, I've always appreciated the, the diversity that I grew up with uh, in Montgomery County. But, uh, you know, if you ever asked me, I would say I'm from Brooklyn. I'm from New York, uh, even though I've lived most of my life here. And, I, you know, I was thinking about uh, the formative narrative that I have uh, about uh, Maryland and why my formative narrative is attached to New York. And I feel like in some ways also the the to give some context uh uh i am the first in my family to be born in the u.s uh, my family's from the caribbean uh and so i didn't always feel uh that i was a uh, uh american or you know african-american in the same ways as uh my other uh, african-american friends who uh, had been in this country for generations uh and um you know, I, I felt like that my uh, formative narrative was connected to New York because of what I associated being African American with as a child. And I think those things were hip hop and uh, and uh, basketball. And, you know, uh, we talk about New York as the Mecca of hip hop and the Mecca of basketball. And then, you know, I didn't know any of these uh, histories. Uh, you know, uh, about Montgomery County, uh, about Sandy Spring, uh, you know, about African Americans being here for generations and generations going uh, back into slavery. And, uh, you know, I wondered, you know, how do we create that formative narrative that connects uh, people like me and those who, you know, even were uh, born in Montgomery County, those who will be born in Montgomery County uh, uh, as African Americans who, you know, don't have this formative narrative around Maryland and Montgomery County, like, you know, or Montgomery County specifically, what connects them here? Because even a lot of my friends who uh, grew up in this area, who are from this area, you know, uh, what was known as being, uh, you know, the, the black area or the African American area was DC or Prince George's County. You, you know, uh, if you were from Montgomery County, you know, it, it wasn't looked at in the same way. So, thinking, how do we, uh, you know, connect, uh, you know, the the here and now to uh, this time period uh, where you know we had uh, free black persons, you know, uh, who who were living lives here. Um, so, you know, uh, I think it's important for, uh, you know, the narratives that we gain from here, uh, from these archives to be able to connect uh, to, uh, you know, what kids are uh, learning locally in schools, uh, you know, uh, you know, what types of arts and, and culture that they can engage with and to know that uh, this diversity is important uh, and who they are specifically is connected to this place. Uh, so the ideas that I had around that, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a creative writer, I, you know, uh, I, I come from a place of, uh, of literature. And uh, so I, I was thinking of these archives in terms of literary storytelling, uh, uh, you know, individually uh, per person, you know, th there's lots of stories that, you know, uh, you can, connect to the larger history of the area at the time. You know, uh, there was a discussion of the Civil War and things like that. Um, but then I, you know, I, I thought about, well, could that be the best way to connect uh, with, uh, you know, the youth culture and, and uh, youth of the area now? And, you know, in some ways I think it could, but then I also thought about um, uh, uh, the digital preservation of culture uh, uh, through interactive and graphic re uh, representation. I, you know, I, I have this uh, idea that I'm going to keep pushing over and over until it comes true. But I feel like that uh, the you know uh, graphic representations in a digital space. So you know, even in a a, a, a video game um, where we can experience. 
uh, cultures or history, uh, you know, in ways like if you visited uh, Williamsburg, Virginia, or, you know, the, if you visit some of the, the Montgomery County parks where you can visit uh, slave quarters and log cabins and, and things of, uh, of that nature. Um, but, you know, to make it interactive, uh, you know, to uh, have the ability for uh, children in uh, Montgomery County Public Schools to uh, interact with uh, the, this local history, um, because you know I, I went to Montgomery P County Public Schools, I, I didn't learn about any of this uh, local history, and I think it's important. Uh, I think it's important to uh, you know uh, have that formative narrative of, about who you are and where you come from and uh, what this area means. Um, and uh, outside of that. Uh, interactive engagement, I had this idea for um, an uh, accompanying uh, uh, guidebook for the archives uh, uh, in uh, transcribing the archives. I feel like there's, uh, you know, lots of storytelling opportunities that reveal, uh, reveals itself uh, during tra uh, transcription. Um, and just, you know, uh, being able to tell stories, uh, you know, through that transcription and, uh, helping others be able to uh, navigate in a way. There was uh, a letter at the beginning of uh, one of the store ledgers from uh, uh, Mr. A.G. Thomas. And, uh, um, you know, I, I spent, uh, you know, the, a, a good 40 minutes transcribing it and, uh, you know, uh, trying to get as much out of this story as possible, you know, that this person's life and uh, what they were doing. And uh, I, I felt like it was significant and important um, to, to just navigate how, uh, you know, uh, life at that time in this area uh, was like. Uh, the, the big idea that I uh, fell upon was, uh, doing a, 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 a theater performance, a stage performance um, uh, surrounding the, um, the, uh, the, the store ledgers um, uh, that would be in the spirit of uh, Samuel Beckett's Waiting uh, for Godot, where uh, uh, Harry Bond uh, would be uh, showing up at the, the, the store to shop and interacting with these other real people. Um, uh, and he would, you know, be spending the, what little money he had earned. And at that point, he, you know, would realize that now that he has no more to spend and he tries to leave to go home, that once he leaves the stage, he's still uh, perpetually in this place, uh, 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 you know, just reflecting the absurdity of being free and also not being <laughs> paid very well and you know uh you know having no money to spend but uh also uh not really having anywhere else to go uh and and even though you're free um and you know i i i i really think there's uh you know something interesting to be said about that you know especially because he is perpetually stuck in time you know we don't even have his uh his death date i mean that's something that i uh, i would like to uh, do more research on but you know uh you know when does actually waiting in a sense for freedom or you know even though he's free um and you know i i also thought about in ways that that could be uh, a, a engaging workshop for uh uh, the youth of Montgomery County, where, uh, you know, they can uh, uh, either interact with these characters on, well, it's not, well, not characters, but these uh, real people on stage who speak directly to them, to the audience, and they learn about these people, or even having, you know, uh, you know, a week-long workshop, a theater workshop, where uh, the, you know, uh, children and youth, uh, you know, are, uh, uh, you know, based on the archives uh becoming these people and embodying them um and and just connecting us a little closer to uh our history here in, in montgomery county yeah thank you so much caleb i'm gonna um unfortunately our guest maria vivar guzman had an emergency and is not able to join us but i am going to read her brief comments and then we'll turn this over into a larger conversation so just to reiterate, these are uh, Maria Vivar Guzman's um, comments. She's the uh, uh, librarian at the 
Prince George's Memorial County Library System. Prince George's County has many community members becoming and acting as local historians, sharing their family experiences and research about BIPOC migration, but especially that of the Black migrant experience. Sandy Springs Museum's resources would allow for further research and connecting the dots for historians outside of the Sandy Spring and Montgomery County areas. Fortunately and unfortunately, PG County Memorial Library System no longer has a Maryland room, but we do have a Prince George's room, which contains a variety of research and historical documents for the county and urban development. Before the holidays, we had a customer who was looking for information about an enslaved man who ran away, a Mr. Carroll who ended up in Canada, and his memories of being enslaved near Van Horns Hill, which with a good deal of research, we were able to finally track down as being around Sandy Spring on plantations owned by the Culvers and the then Valden Valdenars. Valdenar married one of the Culver daughters and became caregiver of the other, and it appears that the enslaved person was passed to that family by way of marriage or wardship. The belief was that libraries, print books, and research centers would slowly become obsolete, making the way for digitally accessed materials. But we, what we have seen is a very steady use of a mix of resources. Much like the folks who still enjoy a hardcover book over an ebook, there are so many community members who still prefer having a paper trail of research. And public libraries are one way they're getting those sources, especially if they're not available digitally because of the cost of digitization. A mix of resources in both hard copy and digital forms from a variety of sources were used in this instance for the customer's research question. This is the sort of bricolage required by deep research into local histories and collections like those at the Sandy Spring Museum make, uh, make possible. A major source of information for us is the African American Historic and Cultural Resources in uh, Prince George's County, Maryland PDF booklet, and the Illustrated Inventory of Historic Sites and Districts, Prince George's County, Maryland PDF booklet, uh, both made available by the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. With the increased popularity of Henry Gates finding your roots, we also have amateur genealogists who come in and want to find their own connections and roots to the communities they grew up in. With all of the above, the biggest question is how do we connect it all together? Whether we've heard it from oral stories with names we hear attached to a community or to having absolutely no clue where to start, libraries and museums are the starting point for memory. Migration from the South to Washington DC and other suburbs in the area is usually researched using newspapers just to start filling in the gaps. But archives like that of Sandy Spring Museum helps library staff continue to provide the connections to these gaps and those stories that are being connected and written about for future generations that then in turn can become accessible to the public. I'd like to, um, in the this portion of our meeting together, I'd like to um, hear from everyone of a theme, there are a couple through lines that really come through and one is connection. I mean, I just, in the words that I just wrote for, for Maria, um, connection and storytelling. Um, and can you all talk about uh, what that means? I mean, I, I get, I'm thinking of specific instances, but if you could reflect upon this idea of connection, connecting what to whom and why. Well, I'll, 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 I'll start there. Uh, yeah, I, I really think connection is important. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, to echo what I said previously, um, you know, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, last summer I worked at the Strathmore and, you know, um, they were working, uh, tirelessly to try to, uh, uh have more community outreach after the pandemic. And so, you know, uh, I, you know, I, I think that there's a rich history in Montgomery County. 
uh, there's, you know, uh, uh, Anne Marie spoke about the, you know, the Sandy Spring community and how small it is, and you know, uh, how do we connect that small community to the the, the larger Montgomery County uh, uh, community? I I think it's important. That's Montgomery County story, you, you know, that w that we don't talk about a, a lot, and uh, you know, I think it should be wider known. There's something interesting you said. Uh, well, uh, that Maria said uh, about uh, finding your roots. It, you know, I, uh, I, man, I, I, I love finding your roots. My, my family does also. And but I think that's what we're doing. We, we want to be finding our roots. You, you know, we, we need to 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 know where we come from and uh, really uh, tap into that and connect to it. And uh, you know, be able to uh, share those stories w with you know. The, the our next generation that you know we're gonna bring into the world so yeah it's 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 very important yeah Yolanda and Anne-Marie do you have thoughts on connection um I think the first thing that comes to my mind is how storytelling is a great connective method, you know, connective tissue. And that, um, you know, there's a teller and there are there is a listener or listeners. And, th and the importance of that relationship um, and that experience for people telling the story as well as people listening to the story. I think this is why I'm so compelled by um, oral history. I also think that oral history has a unique capacity um, to bring subtlety and nuance to historical documents um, or to add to enrich a story in ways that, you know, um, published material may not be able to. Um, I also, uh, you know, the other thing that comes to mind is how we've all been inspired by this store leisure. And I think it's important to note that, like, why, why has everyone leaned into the store, store leisure? And I can't speak for everyone. I'll let everyone speak for themselves. But I think one of the reasons is because it's so relatable. Like, we go to stores. We understand what it's like to purchase things, to purchase things from your home. And I think it's a great opportunity to use documents like that to make connections to the current moment. These documents that are completely relatable, um, very universal. Um, and um, I think it's a it's a great point of discussion. Um, so those are the first two things that come to mind when I think of connection and storytelling. I would agree. I mean, I my mind always goes to teaching, I guess. Um, but I think this is the type I, I, um, I agree with Yolanda and, and you, Caleb, about like, when you start reading all the lines of things that just feel so daily, you know, like things that we also purchase like eight pounds of coffee. And I'm thinking like, who is he providing? You know, how long did that last? And was that for his whole, you know, or that for all his workers? What is that? What does eight pounds of coffee look like in 1850? Um, and maybe I should be buying coffee in eight pounds. <laughs> anyway, um, I think that if we have students engage in that kind of thing, it's just so um, in a moment when there's an an actual argument, like a you know logical argument, which is totally illogical about whether whether these people are actually people, right? Like this is like people are arguing that um, that Harry Bond is not a person, right? In in the Supreme Court, they're arguing that, right? Um, and yet he's purchasing a mug and plates and a lamp for his home. It just makes it so like that kind of putting those documents to to get a. Uh, you know, aside each other, um, I think it's really shocking, and um, and I think it it undermines um, sort of the I don't know some of the racist um, like arguments that are happening at the time, if that makes sense. With just like a very simple thing like a store ledger that you would never think would like okay, so if he's not a person, like what we know, people buy a new mug, right? And and they buy coffee. Um, it just feels it feels like it. Students could latch onto that in small in you know young grades, but also older ones. And I, the last thing I would say is, I also uh, was inspired by a professor who 
has like transcription parties for students where they, she provides pizza and they, I noticed, you know, on your website, there's still a lot of these documents that need to be transcribed and the cursive is really tricky, but even just any way to embed people in this narrative, that's, um, that's one that I thought was pretty creative. And so one of the things that is kind of coming through and it came through with Lydia too, in Lydia's comments is um, how to, how to use an archive that is, was intentionally collected to tell the story of the dominant group. Argue we could talk about that's a it's a feature of all sorts of archives, right? It's it's telling the the story that has already been told. How how what are the kind of intellectually ethical um, methodologies to do that? Some of this we've we've talked about, and it, when. Um, in particular, I think when Yolanda, when you were talking, Yolanda and, and Mary, um, I was I was reminded of a strategy that a colleague at Northeastern who works on early Caribbean um, uh, doc, um, archives to find voices of Black women, and her argument is that there needs to be a, a strategy, and it has a whole kind of digital um, apparatus, actually, Lydia, I'll, I'll share it with you. But that what is the, the intellectual step forward is something called clipping, which is to take these voices from the footnotes and to take them out of the apparatus that has imagined them in one very narrow subjugated way and to, in a sense, listen to them differently and to listen to them on their own terms. So that's just say that the the you know I'm and I'm reminded you know Leolando you mentioned a language guide or the you know so this relates to the question of connection because how are we how are we who are we right I am a you know a physically embodied very very different person from everyone on this call um, how do we kind of embark on an on an intellectual and and community based project that both recognizes this desire for connection while also facing and kind of recognizing the, the longstanding um, 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 obstacles to, to viewing this uh, history. I mean, the headline today that AP African-American history has been, um, you, know, er you know, completely anything today is cut out. So this question of connection is not, is actually very political, politically vo volatile today. Um, you know, uh, so so I just want to talk about the, you know, what are kind of some of the ways, maybe Yolanda, you could talk a little bit more about what it would mean to develop a language guide, because we're dealing with materials that um, are designed to reproduce uh, a raci racist and um, highly discriminatory world. Um, you know, I think the first step would, would be really thinking about the intention behind a language guide. And having that informed by community member stakeholders and um, determining what those intentions are together, um, I think that would be the first step. Um, uh, there are some sample language guides out there. Um, creating maybe a resource page for the community members or something that could be shared. I mean, I, I guess what I'm what what I envision with the language guide is really creating some policy around how you want to speak and tell, you know, the history, you know, how do you want to speak? I mean, what type of language you want to use um, uh, in telling, you know, history from different time periods. Um, but, I, I, but I do believe that a community collaborative approach would be the way to go. And that should be a part of the process very, very, very early on. Are that Lydia, Caleb, Anne-Marie, Allison, uh, thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think any of the projects that we have discussed here, I think it needs to be community collaborative, uh, 100%. Uh, you know, the, uh, I had visited the Sandy Springs Slave Museum and, you know, just learning that rich history of the people who, you know, existed in that area. Like, yeah, they should be 
you know, uh, telling their stories. I, I, I like that idea of the oral history too, you know, sitting down and, uh, you know, having these conversations with them, you, you know, uh, you know, getting the, the full picture from them, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, even having them look at the archives and, and, uh, you know, well, I guess that would be that collaborative input, you know, and, and getting, uh, that outlook on, on, you know, uh, you know, this is what this person said. How do you feel about it? You know? Allison, yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking about, um, you know, what you're saying about uh, Ron DeSantis and this movement to to almost like erase the Black history. But I feel like what our project is showing is that you can't. Like, I feel like our community almost tried to erase the Black history by saying, oh, no, no, there's nothing about Black history in here. It's only white history. And I feel like what we're doing is almost reappropriating the materials that were almost specifically gathered to honor the white families that we're gonna reappropriate them and use them to tell everybody's story instead. I, I would just like to say, I think that's the story in Montgomery County, that, that that's that diverse history, you know, that, that uh, you know, continues to live on. this too is that some of the issues Lydia that you talked about with you know um, uh, with with working with a descendant community and particularly say around the medical archives um I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about you know these are our these are records from medical visits long time ago right um yet you're in a community that has feels a connection to them and so could you talk a little bit about what the, as, as the caretaker for the archives and as a, a partner with the community, what, you know, what are the issues and, and what are the ways to work through this and, and yeah, just kind of elaborate because this really gets to methodology and connection. Well, sure. Yeah. So, um, we we learned early on that 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 when we first started doing this project, um, Allison and I were looking at this material and how we would think this would be interesting and how we we would interpret this. And um, and during our first community meeting um, that involved um, a Sharp Street Church, another um, predominantly black uh, church across the street, as well as the Slave Museum, um, you know we realize that it really doesn't matter what we find interesting. Um, it's, it's really largely um, related to what the community, how the community, as you say, connects to this material. And so, um, so we had a listening um, session with the descendant community or in early December um, that was led by a community member who has now joined our, um, joined our um, uh, project as well. Um, and, um, and, we were able to to witness and and listen to um, how these people, um, the descendants, were connecting to this material. And as we move along, they will be um, a part of every step of the way. Um, terming in terms of what were you know what subjects were highlighting in this material, what words we're using to describe it. Our role is simply to make it accessible. So. I hope that answered. <laughs> yes, Yolanda, please. Think. Yes, I'm curious to know how is the descendant community engaged with Sandy Springs Museum? Are they, you know, part of an advisory board? How involved and to what degree are they involved with Sandy Springs Museum um, as a whole? Allison, do you want to take that? I'm not sure I could say as a whole. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of individuals that um, are members of the museum who attend programs. I, I don't, I definitely can't speak about the community as a whole. In this particular project, um, as Lydia said, we have a descendant community member who is, um, uh, I forget what title she is, but she's a consultant on our project. I think it was, it's like the, almost like a community liaison. And she is the one who is um, establishing all the community meetings, bringing people in to have discussions when we come, when we confront a topic that we feel like we, we need 
more community input on. Um, and then it's up to community members whether or not they want to participate in those discussions. So I, I hesitate to talk about the community as a whole for that reason. Well, and I'm, it, you know, I'm aware of the time. I want to. I'm really struck by the ways in which um, Henry Bond figured in so many um, comments and. And something Caleb said, in, in, in one way, he seems perpetually stuck in time. Um, he's in that store and he's he's bought these things and he's earned this money. Um, but also he's not, I, you know, so I think he, I'm seeing him as a kind of figure for our conversation today and for the, the project of the kind of public humanities work in general. And I wanna see the play, I wanna read the novel, I wanna see the video game. Yes, absolutely. Um, but for now, I will close by thanking each, you know, thanking everyone here. I'm so grateful for your expertise, your nuance and care with this project, with these questions. And as always, I wanna thank very much Dr. Karen Nelson for everything she does with the center. And um, all right, this is when we say goodbye and it all goes. Uh, and there are compliments coming in through the chat. So thank you so much, everyone.